Hello and welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 12.14. Very glad to have you here in Station 204 with us. My name is Jared. I'll be talking a little bit today along with Sarah as well. We're going to be both talking a little bit today to a, <laughs> a very interesting guest uh, that we have today, Dr. Jai Li Jung, who uh, is coming to us right now from across the pond at Oxford. Uh, Dr. Jung, you have a uh, Bachelor's of Engineering in Science and Physics, Mathematics, and Aeronautical Space Engineering from the University of Sydney. You got your PhD in Astronomy and Astrophysics from the University of Toronto, and you're currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford and a Schmidt Science Fellow. So you have done uh, just a little bit of science work uh, in your in your <laughs> career so far, just a little bit. Um, so what where did you get interested in science at? Like, what was that spark that got you interested in science? Mm -hmm. I think I've always been quite interested in science. When I was young, I liked asking questions about how things around me worked, but I didn't realize that's what I wanted to do for a career. Up until grade 10, I wanted to be an artist. Yeah. Um, but then in grade 10, I discovered that my favorite part of science, like the science had a lot of stuff in it. And there was one part that was physics, which was all my favorite bits of, of science. And I thought, okay, Let's not be an artist. Let's be a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you, can, you can do both, but what kind of art were you? did you start with? Uh, so I was young, and I was very vague about what exactly art was. And I didn't even know how you would make money with art. But I liked no drawing. Does. I liked painting. <laughs> I liked making weird things. Um, basically making really beautiful things that made people happy or other emotions. I didn't... Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to really quickly follow up. Have you thought about combining art with science? We've, we actually, a couple weeks ago, had uh, a New Horizons team member, and there are a lot of artists mm -hmm. on that team, including Brian May. Uh, may have heard of that musician. Yeah. yeah. Guitarist uh, for Queen. Yeah. Minor, minor <laughs> detail. But, yeah, so have you thought about combining your, ast your astronomy and your art, even maybe as a teaching tool? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot more about it recently, actually. Um, uh, as uh, Jared introduced me, I'm the Schmidt Science Fellow, and there's actually 13 other Schmidt Science Fellows in my year. And one of them is very interested in science and art. Uh, and we've been talking a lot about how to do them together. Historically, um, people didn't separate them as much as we do today. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Da Vinci both did art and and science and engineering. And via art, it actually helped him with his science and engineering. Um, similarly, when people were studying neurons for the very first time, it was through art that the depictions of how these uh, neuron networks uh, work, that that's how that was communicated. But it was also art. Um, so I'm starting to definitely think about it. Maybe I'll go do a 360. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, got, uh, you're definitely in a good place to do that with Oxford yeah. uh, there, where you're currently at. So it'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you continued on uh, into college working on uh, science degrees and uh, eventually getting your doctorate as well. In that. And what is that journey like? What's it like uh, to go through that all the way up to getting your doctorate? Oh, that's a big question. So many, so many fields. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me with getting a PhD was learning how to learn and learning how to trust yourself in the learning and exploring process. Um, I think everybody's PhD journey is very different and it can be it, the, the difference can be even bigger because of how good your supervisor can be. And I just want to give a shout out to my supervisor, <laughs> Roboto Abraham and Peter Martin at the University of Toronto. They were the kind of supervisors that um, they, they cared for you as a person first. And, and research was part of your person, but research wasn't the only part of you. And, and so for me, I, I think... I grew as a person and not just a researcher, and research became part of me. Now that's starting to sound a little bit corny, but I feel like <laughs> no, not corny at all. I uh -uh. mean, when you when you go into something and you really just like grab onto it and you hold onto it and you make it a part of yourself, yeah, um, you know that's a very strong motivator to push you forward. 
Yeah, a lot of people are um, picking, you know, where to go for their PhD right now. And I think picking the right advisor who cares about you as a person and will support you in or your facets, for example, if you wanted to combine science and art, is really important because you are more than your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. Um, and uh, you continued on to Oxford as well. What uh, what made you do the jump over to Oxford? Mm -hmm. um, jumping over to Oxford in, in academia, it's not a very strange thing to jump around all over the place because you kind of go wherever there's a job opening and there isn't always a job opening in the place that you want to go. But the bigger jump I made is not actually location. It's um, for this year that I am at Oxford, I'm not doing astronomy. I'm actually doing medical imaging. Yeah. Uh, and that's thanks to the Schmidt Science Fellowship. They fund um, fellows to do interdisciplinary science and learn deeply about another field so that they can use techniques from and uh, use techniques from two different fields um, and help each other. What made you choose medical imaging? Ah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, so during my PhD, it, people ask me this a lot, so I'm very practiced at answering <laughs> this question. Um, no notes. <laughs> During my PhD, um, the aspect that I loved most about it, and we'll probably talk a little bit about this later, about the Dragonfly Telephoto Array, was building a telescope and the capability to see the universe in a way that hasn't been seen before. And the, the kind of one of the next biggest questions in astronomy is what the sky looks like, not uh, for all time, because the sky doesn't change very much in general, but from second to second. And we're discovering that even though we've used the same stars to navigate the oceans for hundreds and thousands of years, um, those stars are permanent, but underneath that, there's a, there's a whole universe, excuse the pun, of <laughs> phenomena that's changing on over days, uh, minutes, hours, and seconds. And so what I wanted to do was try and build capability to be able to detect those changes. So for example, a star appears and then disappears again. But that's really difficult. Um, in Historically, when astronomers take photos, we build the biggest telescopes possible, and then we stare at this galaxy for the longest time possible so that we get a really long exposure time. And this long exposure time allows us to see the faintest parts of the galaxy and really understand all the bits of it. But if we want to see something that's changing and that appears one second and then disappears again, then if you take an exposure for 10 minutes, but that thing was only lit up for a second, you won't see it because it, it'll get washed out. There's not enough light from one second of light versus all, all the other light that's um, bright for the whole 10 minutes. So we need new techniques to be able to take photos of faint things uh, with very short exposures. And then we'll end up with just way too many pictures and we have to learn to process through them. One thing that medical imaging has been doing for a long time, or at least longer than astronomy, is using deep learning, which is a machine learning technique to process images, detect outliers, um, and, and understand images. And so I've gone into medical imaging to learn how they do that and then try and bring that into astronomy in a mature fashion and discover what these flashing lights are in the universe. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, interdisciplinary maxed it out right yeah, there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. uh, quite interesting that you can bring those two together. Um, yeah. And you know, the Dragonfly Telephoto Array, um, tell us a little bit about that, because that is, not only is it a telescope, it's like a non-traditional kind of telescope. Like we were, we were looking at photos of it and we're used to our Zeiss refractor up at Griffith Observatory <laughs> and this looked nothing like it. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, the, the design is a central, this weird looking telescope, which is made up of many, many small lenses is, is very strange. Um, and I'll tell you how it came about. So for, as, as I said earlier, for the longest time, we've been trying to build bigger and bigger telescopes. Uh, for example, there's a telescope that we're trying to build right now called the 30 meter telescope. It's gonna be 30 meters across. We're very good at naming things. <laughs> uh, so 
The reason why we build bigger telescopes is when something is really faint, if you have a bigger telescope, you have a bigger light collecting bucket. If you have a bigger light collecting bucket, then you can see fainter things. Also, if you want to see things that are very, very, um, very small, so you need a very high resolution to be able to see what what's going on, you also need bigger telescopes. And so for the last hundreds of years, telescope development is all about bigger, bigger telescope, better. Um, and all the engineering has gone in to facilitate that. However, if you're not trying to see small, faint things, and on the other hand, you're trying to see big, faint things, big things, for example, galaxies or faint nebula um, or dust and gas in, in our galaxy, they're all fuzzy patches. They're, they're patches of light instead of points of light. And for the last 40 years, our ability to see patches of light that are faint hasn't improved at all. So building these bigger telescopes hasn't allowed us to see fainter patches of light. And so that's when my advisor and one of his collaborators at Yale University, um, so this is Bob in, at the University of Toronto and Peter at the, oh, there we go, they're on either sides of this photo with the rest of the Dragonfly team. Um, they, they thought, well, what, why, why are we not getting any better at imaging faint fuzzy patches such as galaxies? And the conclusion was that in order to optimize and in order to see these faint fuzzy patches, the thing that stops us from being able to see it is refracted light, reflected light inside the telescope itself. So, you know, when you go out on a sunny day and you take a picture and if you have the sun directly lighting into your camera, you get these uh, flare, sun flares, and it looks really artsy and it's really pretty. Have, have uh, you seen that Abrams report? Effect. <laughs> Sorry? The J.J. Abrams effect. He used it a lot in the movie uh, Star Trek. Anyway. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. I'll take you in for it. Um, well, that, that's really artsy and beautiful, but if you're trying to see a faint object and there's these flares, um, these, this, these flares in your photos, then you can't see it. Um, the thing is, in it, this happens in astronomical telescopes, which are is just like a fancy camera with a fancy lens. They have it too, um, and and even the faintest amount of this means that you can't see faint fuzzy patches because those fuzzy patches. How do you know it's like a galaxy, or it's just because of some bright thing, uh, you know, scattering light into the this that that particular part of the photo. And so the Dragonfly telescope, if you look at um, the telescope, you can see that it's made up of multiple lenses. And these lenses are actually Canon lenses. They're commercial lenses. Uh, and you can buy them for about $12,000 each. And they, yeah, so you can see that yeah. in this photo. <laughs> the reason why they were used in this telescope is because they have on, so inside are these lenses, and on the surface of the lens, um, there is a proprietary technology that um, is coded onto the lens. That means light going going through the lens, most like 99.9999% goes through, and a t only a tiny, tiny little gets reflected into and scattered into wrong parts of the image. For most cameras. Um, only 98% of the light goes through and the rest gets scattered to other weird parts of the image, making them possibly look like fake galaxies. Okay, wow. Um, so, yeah, so someone... <laughs> you actually answered a lot of our questions from the chat room. Yeah. I'm just going to run through some of these. Oh, you did. <laughs> it's great. Uh, so, uh, is the array uh, made of commercially available off-the-shelf lenses, was asked by uh, Osin uh, on our chat room. And <laughs> let's see. So, that's a yes. Yep. Um, uh, and then... Uh, could you explain how the Dragonfly Imager is constructed? Uh, was asked by Rebel2 on our chat room. Thank you so I Love it. Awesome. Okay, so. <laughs> Damn. Oh, I forgot to say, um, I said how for 40 years, people weren't able to image faint galaxies any better. Um, so we can do 10 times fainter than, than what was possible before. 
Nice. Which I think is amazing. Like something doesn't change for 40 years and then bam, this weird design makes yeah. it 10 times better. <laughs> Wow. Um, so heliopausing <laughs> is asking, um, are they not optically connected like some arrays? Um, so do they work together with that? That's a really uh, in, in-depth in question. Like, you know, some <laughs> I can tell you know some astronomy there. Um, so uh, there, there are, there are these tel- radio, let me let me talk a tiny little bit about what optically connected might mean so that other people know what you're talking about. Um, so there are radio telescopes and they you, you can have telescopes at hundreds, thousands, continents apart. For example, the telescope that's being built right now, the square kilometer array. Half of the, uh, the telescopes for the square kilometer array are going to be built in South Africa and the other half are going to build, be built in Australia. But the signals that they collect from this, from the same source, they get, con- they get combined with each other and they work together to, to produce the image. So for example, the latest news um, from astronomy that you heard, the, 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 this gorgeous, incredible photo of the black hole, um, in M87 done by the Event Horizon Telescope. So that was um, connecting the optical or the radio, which is, I mean, optical just means light and radio is a type of light. Mm-hmm. Um, it's connecting connecting information from different telescopes together. So for the Dragonfly Telephoto Array, each of the lenses um, take fo- images completely independently. They don't get um, connected in the same way that radio telescopes do at all. However, Imagine if you had uh, one camera here taking the photo with the sun in the background with these flare, artsy flares, and then you had another camera taking the same photo, but like from a slightly different angle, Um, then the flares will end up on different parts of the image. If you combine them and get this both information from both of these pictures, you'll be able to work out where, uh, what, what is from the sun flare. Uh, do, do you do you guys call them flares or do you call them ghosts? Um, flares. Just lens flares yeah, is kind flare of what typically. we call them. So flare. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you can like work out what is flare and what is like reality. And so we use that the information from all these lenses together to even further reduce any scattered flare effects. And oh. is that kind of where the deep learning comes in? Uh, analyzing the separate uh, images? A very interesting way to use deep learning. It definitely would be. Um, but uh, that's not what I was thinking, but maybe, you know, you've given me some ideas. Oh, hey. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> Make sure to cite us on the paper, please. <laughs> well, I bring it yeah. up because Helio pausing on our chat room was asking if you could possibly explain deep learning a little bit. Okay, um, I can do this because I was a total noob and novice and had no idea what was going on six months ago. Uh, and so I still remember what it means to not know anything. Um, wait, so deep learning, um, p- people, might, you might've heard about um, this thing called machine learning. Uh, machine learning is when you give the machine lots of information, lots and lots of examples um, of like, say, if you want to make the prediction of whether a person likes strawberries or not, and you give it lots of examples and information about people who like strawberries and people who don't like strawberries. And then the machine uh, sorts out all this information and then makes a prediction about what uh, what makes someone like strawberries what is a good predictor of whether someone likes strawberries? So when you use uh, these machine learning techniques, you have to decide whether you uh, put in the person's date of birth, if you whether you should put in the person's height or put in whether they like bananas. So you have to decide all the different pieces of information to put into the machine learning algorithm in order to, and then you let it do its prediction of whether the person likes strawberries. The the special thing about deep learning, which is a type of machine learning technique, is that you don't need to figure out what information to give it if the kind of prediction you want to do is is predictions about images. So, for example, um, if I got 
if I had, you know, a, a billion images of of faces from from the internet, and um, the internet has these labels of whether these faces uh, are happy or sad or or sa- they're eating something sour, um, then you, you you can pass the prediction, which is whether the person's happy or eating something sour or they're sad um, into the mach- uh, into the computer, but you can directly give the computer the picture. You don't have to figure out what information to extract from the picture and then give it to the machine to let it predict. Deep learning algorithms directly take in pictures and figures out what features in the pictures are important for the prediction that you want to make. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so no people, no people necessary. So. Right. Um, Thank you, Skynet. Yeah, yeah, good way to do that. Um, you still in, have to see the, the pictures, and and a human have to have looked at a bunch of pictures and decided if it's sour or not. But you don't have to decide what to take out from the pictures anymore. Right. Yeah, and we had Which a question. Oh yeah, yeah. So we had a uh, we had a question from our chat room. I don't know where it went. Unfortunately, it was in our YouTube chat room. Um, but they were asking, you know, have there been any discoveries that have been done uh, with the Dragonfly Telescope? And yes, there have. Mm-hmm. We've actually covered uh, one of their discoveries on a, a galaxy with very little dark matter in it. Um, but what are some of the overall discoveries so far that's been done uh, with the Dragonfly Telescope mm-hmm. Array? Yeah. Um, so my when we set out to build this Dragonfly um, Telescope, we were not thinking about these discoveries because, well, we didn't know they were there to be discovered. And so um, we had questions, known questions, because there's known questions and then questions that you can't even predict, right? Um, So when we first started building Dragonfly, and part of the motivation for my thesis is to try and understand how galaxies evolve and grow. And so my my thesis was all about about galaxies. Um, When I started People, when you go to like a class on astronomy, people would tell you uh, this is how big a galaxy is and these are all the things in the galaxy. Um, But then I was also told that telescopes are not good at imaging faint parts of galaxies. And so when people said, oh, this is how big a galaxy is, I I thought, how do you know? (laughs) Our telescopes aren't good enough to see the faintest parts of galaxies. And so I hypothesized that if we could build a telescope that could see fainter patches of light, such as light from galaxies, maybe galaxies are way bigger than we thought. And so, um, and and indeed, that's what we found. Um, there's a I have this picture of a large disk galaxy um, that shows what people thought galaxies looked like um, before we use Dragonfly to observe. So this picture here is of a galaxy called NGC 2820. 20, oh my goodness, I can't believe I can't remember the number anymore. Because <laughs> it rolls off it's the only been, <laughs> um 2841, I think, but I might be wrong because I've forgotten four numbers. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the center of this picture, you can see um, in, co- in color and it looks kind of yellowish. Is, is this galaxy, um, the, the, the size of this galaxy, you can kind of see it kind of fades out and people thought it wasn't that big. But after we observed it with Dragonfly, um, you can see the, the, pic- the black and white picture behind the colored image is actually what the galaxy looks like with Dragonfly. And you can see there's a pair of blue arrows and the furthest stretches of starlight from this galaxy go all the way out to these blue arrows. And this is uh, about three times bigger than what we thought this galaxy was. Uh, and this, this changes um, our understanding of how the, the galaxy grows. We understand that galaxies grow from inside out. So the centers of galaxies are kind of where the oldest stars are. And it was built out first. And then slowly it grows over time. And so by by being able to identify the outermost parts of stars, then we can study them in more detail and understand how galaxies grow. Uh, so I thought galaxies were bigger than they 
they we thought they were and they 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 were but it was three times bigger which is unexpected i thought it'd be you know maybe 50 percent bigger <laughs> wow. yeah We've got a question from uh, Graham W. on YouTube, and he's asking about collaboration uh, between, uh, well, in different parts of the spectrum. Don't they use radio telescopes to observe faint galaxies and gas? And so how is Dragonfly Absolutely. working in concert with this? And yeah. <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, and that's absolutely right. So galaxies are made up um, of many different parts. One part are stars, and stars is what gives off visible light. But you're absolutely right. There's also gas in, in galaxies. And this gas, even though you cannot see it in visible light, you can see it in radio light. And so when you observe in, in radio, um, you, the gas extends out really far. Um, and typically in papers um, from about the 1950s all the way up until today, recently, all these papers talk about that the gas disk of galaxies is way bigger than the stellar disk of galaxies, like up to two or three times bigger. But that just turned out not to be true. And so when earlier when I was talking about the galaxies three times bigger, you caught me. It's I was talking about the stellar component of the galaxy being three times bigger. But we always knew that the influence of the galaxy, for example, the gas associated with it, it did extend further. Um, and your question was about how these um, information from different wavelengths of light, such as radio and visible wavelengths, can come together to help us understand. Um, by studying uh, the, the gas component, the stellar component, and also the young stellar component of these galaxies, you can start to understand how this disk forms over time. Very, very cool. Um, and I actually want to ask two questions. Yeah, I want to ask two questions from our chat room. Um, the first one comes from Astro YYZ, uh, which is, is that previously unobserved outer part of the galaxy, is it exposure? Is it dust in the way, dark matter? Is it equipment used? Or is there something else that does that? Mm -hmm. uh, exposure, dust, you've, you've hit on quite a few. Um, so. The, the aspect of exposure, um, it, I'm going to talk about the exposure part and the equipment use part together. So if we were to use a really a traditional telescope, for example, one of these really large ones that people like to build um, and, and take an image of the galaxy and we take an exposure for a really, really long time, you would get you, you would see start to see faint stars, but you would not see the faint fuzzy patches of the galaxies. And it's because these faint fuzzy patches will be confused with scattered light um, that makes it just look like uneven background in, 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 in the image. So for, for example, when you take a photo with the sun in the foreground and then it makes these flares, it'll look like that. And so the, what, the, the new equipment that enables this observation is the Dragonfly telephoto array. And these lenses on Dragonfly and the, and the fact that there are many lenses together, it means that the, we can identify and eliminate the scattered light. And the, so these flare effects um, in the images and, and peel that away and see the faint galaxy underneath. But we still have to expose for a really, really, really long time. So let me try and do a quick cal calculation in my head. Um, the, the image of um, NGC 2841 that I showed earlier, uh, that was about 1,500 images, each one with a 10 minute exposure. Whew. Holy moly. I'm gonna let you do the multiplication. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, Google. Google can do That's a bit. Can, can go That's, to and Google. Yeah, someone in the chat room will figure it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with that there. And, uh, and so, yeah, exposure is definitely a part. But I just want to highlight a, a, another part of your question, which is dust. Um, it turns out that when we build a really good telescope that allows us to see faint um, things in the sky, the thing that 
limits our ability to see the faintest things in other galaxies is dust in our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and and which is which is incredible because dust there are scientists who study dust in our own Milky Way galaxy. You may think it sounds kind of boring or oh, you're studying dust and it's not even the type from Philip Pullman's um, uh, book, His Dark Materials, you know, there's, that dust is really interesting for those of you who have read his books. Um, but this is literally just specks of dust floating around in the universe. Well, people study that because these uh, points of dust help material in the universe cool and therefore form stars. So it's actually really interesting. And suddenly we can use the dragonfly telephoto array to study that as well. But at the same time, it's kind of annoying because it's blocking the galaxy <laughs> behind it. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, and I was gonna, I just wanted to throw this out there. Uh, Dr. Brian May, mm -hmm. um, actually, if I recall correctly, his doctoral thesis was on dust within our solar system. Um, if, if I recall correctly Sounds um, pretty right. about that. So, uh, yeah, so very interesting stuff. Uh, the second part of the question um, <laughs> that I want to ask, we've got a whole lot of questions about this um, in, the, uh, in the chat room, and we'll see if, if any, anyone can speak to this. But uh, St. Alex, uh, on behalf of a multitude of people, um, <laughs> is asking if the galaxies are bigger than thought, uh, does that end up changing the estimates of uh, for dark matter in our universe? So does if, if galaxies are way bigger than they actually, we actually thought that they were, does that change the amount or ratio of dark matter to be expected? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question again. Um, so even though the galaxy in, in distance, in physical size is could be three times bigger than what we previously thought. The number of stars in that faint, faint outer region is very small. And so it doesn't change um, the total amount of stars in the galaxy very much because most of the stars are still in the center. Um, but what it, it mostly what it changes is understanding how the stars and materials put together in the galaxy. Very, very cool. So doesn't change much. So <laughs> yeah. even yeah. though it, it takes a lot of space, there's a not not a lot of mass. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's so, why it was so hard to see because there were not many stars there. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah that would make sense yep. then since it's, it's <laughs> diffuse, uh, like we were talking about it's earlier. It's diffuse and very faint because not many stars. <laughs> Very cool. Now, uh, CFIT in our chat room has, has asked a question. You know, the telescope has grown over time. Are they finished expanding Dragonfly or will they add more lenses in the future? And uh, just for a little bit of background, it's how many lenses did it start with and what is it at now and is it gonna expand? Mm -hmm. um, in 2012, we started the very first experiments were done, were done with one lens. And then very quick, because it worked very quickly, we went to three lenses. And then we had that for about a year. Then it went to 10. Um, and now we're at 48. Uh, and I will do a plug for the Dragonfly Telephoto Array. If you are a very rich person and want to donate to science and discover the undiscovered things in the universe, you can help us build a more a bigger dragonfly so that we can image uh, image more parts of the sky and also see even fainter things such as this thing called the cosmic web. Mm. And uh, what what is there specifically yeah. about the the cosmic web that dragonfly can do with that? Yeah, like what's uh, what's the future of dragonfly look like? Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few really cool things planned with Dragonfly. One of them is a wide field survey of the whole sky. So this work is led by uh, Danny, uh, Shani Danielli at, the, at Yale University. And she, oh, actually, she's half at Yale and half at Harvard. Um, and we, so we, these, in, these um, discoveries of galaxies Oh, wait, I haven't even talked about that at all. It was featured on one of your previous um, news podcasts about the discoveries of these galaxies called ultra diffuse galaxies. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about that yet. Well, let's talk about yeah. them real quick. Tell us, tell us about those ultra diffuse okay. galaxies. And the dark web. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> um, so we set out, we built Dragonfly to understand uh, galaxies that we knew about. Um, but when we pointed them at clusters of galaxies um, and galaxies in general, we discovered these whole new class of galaxies called ultra diffuse galaxies. They, uh, their characteristic is that they're very puffy. Oh, oh here's a pic picture. So they, um, they're very, very faint and, and diffuse. So their light is spread over a large area and each part of the galaxy is really, really faint and there are not many stars. These galaxies turn out to be really, really strange. So for example, um, some of these galaxies were discovered to have no dark matter and others of these galaxies were discovered to have um, mostly dark matter and they're, they're a conundrum. Um, and We've only just surveyed, uh, uh, we've only just taken pictures of a few parts of the universe and we found these very strange objects. And so the wide field, oh, so yeah. So for example, um, there was there's this galaxy, Dragonfly 44, um, and this, the size of the galaxy, like the physical size of the galaxy is as big as galaxies such as the Milky Way or in pictured in the top of this picture, the Andromeda galaxy. So in physical extent, it's just uh, that it's really big. However, when you count up the number of stars and the mass in the stars, it's a hundred to a thousand times less than a normal Milky Way galaxy. Um, and that's why it took so long to find them because with that, with such a small number of stars, they're really, really faint. Um, and so we found these weird galaxies and um, the next thing that Dragonfly is set up to do is to kind of tr take, uh, uh, take, create these images of the entire sky and count up how many different types of these galaxies there are. Um, are they more common around galaxy, other galaxy clusters where lots of galaxies are collected together. Or actually there's a whole bunch out where there's no galaxies, which are like usually areas we don't even look at. But with this wide field survey, we'll be able to see all of these things and count them up, take stock, um, and not just be like, oh, there's a weird one here. There's a weird one there. We'll be able to figure out the population. Very cool. And we got a couple questions yeah. from our chat room and YouTube. And I'm going to pick this one. Adam Synergy on YouTube was mm -hmm. wanting, wondering if it would hap help if we had a dragonfly array in orbit. Or are there plans for an orbital array very much like dragonfly? Mm -hmm. I think... Um I would, I would love, absolutely love to have a dragonfly in orbit. One of the things that this would overcome is um, when you take a picture of the night sky, you you might notice that some parts of this, like other than the stars, which are the bright bits, um, or if you take a picture of the moon, other than the moon, you notice that even the dark parts of the of the image, they. Oh yeah, the more carefully we look, the more there is to see, I agree. Um, uh, from our chat room, yeah, somebody <laughs> yeah. Uh, wrote that real quick in there. It's so true, that's my favorite thing about science. It's like, you start with questions and you're very interested and you look deeper into it and it's a, it's a present that keeps on giving. There are just <laughs> more and more questions. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, back to uh, taking a picture of the night sky you notice like the bright bits first, like the stars, or if you take a picture of the moon. But if you look really, really carefully, and if you can somehow um, block out your mind or physically on the computer, block out the light from the stars, you'll notice that the background is not perfectly black and it's not uniformly dark either. There'll be parts of the image that's like a bit brighter and a bit lighter. And that's because the sky is not perfectly black. For example, in a city, lights from the ground gets reflected up into the atmosphere and that light gets scattered around. And you can, you can that, those different parts of the sky may light up differently. If we can put a, and, and oh, very importantly, this is really bad when you're trying to observe faint, large mm -hmm. galaxies in the sky, because say um, this is, say, 
the, the whole screen is your picture and my head is the galaxy. And this part of my, oh no, that's a bright part. This part of the <laughs> galaxy is really faint. Um, and, but the back, the background, the sky right here is like a little bit brighter than the sky here. Then you'll think that this part of the galaxy is brighter, but mm -hmm. actually it's just the sky. And that's really difficult to disentangle. If you can get outside of the earth's atmosphere, then all of those effects disappear and suddenly you have a clean, flat background and, and any light above that would be galaxy. Interesting. So it would be cool to have a dragonfly in space. Very, very cool. Yeah, so yes. get, get that big donor um, yep. in order to help NASA. make that happen. Yes. More money, please. <laughs> NASA, yeah. <laughs> With some of those things there. Um, now, <laughs> of all the sciences um, that, that people frequently get to you know, hear about, um, astronomy seems to be the one that sort of makes everybody kind of like lean back a little bit and go, whoa, uh, about that. So what is it, what is it about astronomy that sort of makes it um, like this science that, that can really like tremendously change a person through, through thinking about it or looking at it or getting into it? Um, how, I guess the best way to say it is how can astronomy be like a gateway science yep. for a lot of people? <laughs> That's, that's the word I often use. Astronomy is definitely a gateway science. I think one aspect of astronomy, now to go full circle back to art, is that it's absolutely beautiful. Um, pictures of galaxies, pictures of planets, um, planetary nebula, uh, supernova remnants, uh, uh, gas and dust and uh, nurseries where stars are born and stars that die. These images are beautiful. And when, when I think when humans see a beautiful picture, it immediately draws you in and it's pleasurable and you start to ask questions naturally. The, the sky above us is also something that um, is accessible to a lot of people maybe not in cities, but as soon as you step outside of a city or you go to an observatory, or even if within a city, you, you take an image of the moon, there are so many details on it. And you just start to wonder this, this little, this, it gives you a perspective where all the billions of people of humanity will live on this tiny rock floating and orbiting around a single star that's one star out of billions of stars in one galaxy, which is out of the billions of galaxies in the observable universe. Are we alone? Where did we come from? Does history extend forever? It, was there a beginning of time? Is there going to be an end in time? These questions, I think, I think everybody has a sense of curiosity about those kinds of questions. Um, you don't need to understand very much to be able to appreciate these questions either. Um, and, and that's a really beautiful part of astronomy. It's that you don't need to understand how to code or the, the nitty gritty details. And you can immediately appreciate that the kinds of questions we ask about where the universe came from and how we came to be, are we alone? You can appreciate that immediately. Yeah, and um, and for people who may not sort of feel that way about astronomy, like what's a really good way, um, like what's a way that you found that in approaching people that are like that, that kind of changes their their mind about astronomy? Ah, that's a really interesting question. I find that when people talk about other planets in the solar system, people get really interested because, I mean, we live on Earth, it's, it's just super cool to imagine the possibility of living on another planet. And we, you know, it's, we, we walk, we take a hike into a mountain and we see this beautiful waterfall and it, it moves us. Can we do that on another planet? What is it like there? Uh, this exploratory experiential nature, um, when we think about planets, I think does definitely draw on a lot of other people too. Yeah, well, I'm definitely uh, down to go climb some mountains on other planets. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. So I don't know which one I, I want to do. 
concert? I said, I don't know which one I'd want to do, though, because Olympus Mons is, like, the tallest, yeah. but its slope is, like, so low, you, can basically, you basically, like, walk up Olympus yeah. Mons. Um, <laughs> I think I think Io might be really fascinating. Yeah, that would be cool. Also, I think Ahuna Mons is one of the tallest in terms of ratio with its uh, with its parent body series, so maybe that one. Um, mm. Maybe I'll go climb Ahuna Mons um, <laughs> at some point in my life. You all know Ahuna a good climbing spot. Yeah, I'll come with you. <laughs> Can we get my Jeep out there? <laughs> so anyways. <laughs> recently, there was a paper published. Yeah, recently, there was a paper published about uh, these lakes on Titan. And mm -hmm. the, so you take these images and there are these lakes, things that look like lakes. And then you take an image sometime later and it's gone. So yep. imagine like driving along and the lake just disappears. A dry lake bed. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm all for it. Uh oh. <laughs> oh boy. So. <laughs> all right. So you've been using astronomy to inspire some people in uh, students in West Africa through an organization uh, that has a really fantastic acronym uh, of <laughs> YCIA. <laughs> and so I was wondering if yes, you could tell us a little bit about this organization. That's right. YCIA stands for West African International Summer School for Young Astronomers. It's a summer school that's been running since 2012. And the goal of the summer school is threefold. The first is to build a community of astronomers in West Africa. There's a few astronomers, but they want to build a bigger community there. The second goal is to inspire and, uh, and teach and motivate the next generation of young scientists and scientific leaders in West Africa. There, is, there's, there are so many young people in West Africa. Um, and oh yeah, this is a really great photo from the summer school in 2017 in Accra, Ghana. There are so many young people with in amazing, incredible ideas, um, but there just aren't many courses of astronomy or many opportunities to, under, to, to learn what astronomy is all about. And so even though there are these uh, students bustling with ideas, they don't have an outlet. Um, YCIA is an outlet and a, an opportunity to make like-minded like um, STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics undergraduate students interested in astronomy, learn about astronomy, and then students can decide if they want to continue with astronomy. The way that YCIA, um, the YCIA curriculum works is based on education research. So it's not like a bunch of people fly in, sit there, give lectures, and then fly out as soon as the lecture is over. The program is, was developed uh, over a whole year and is constantly updating. Students turn up, they get shown beautiful astronomical pictures, for example, of other planets, of the sun, of stars, clusters of stars, galaxies, supernova, and they get to ask their own questions, whatever questions come to mind about these astronomical images. Then they form teams and design their own investigation to answer their question. And then they basically, we don't like tell them any answers. Uh, it's very frustrating for students who've never done this before. I mean, as a scientist, I get frustrated every day when something doesn't work and doesn't make sense. So they go through the same process of scientific discovery, which involves frustration. And then in the end, they come out and realize they have the capability to answer questions that they asked without somebody telling them the answer. And that, that's what science and that's what astronomy is all about. So what has been some of your yeah. favorite moments in this so far? Because this sounds like an, like an incredible yeah. opportunity for, for these, these folks to get. So what have been some of your favorite moments during this program? My favorite moment is definitely um, when 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 the students get put into and this it's not a favorite moment because this happens over and over and over again. We've had the school three times now, so these students they form teams and before they go off and do the investigation, we do a little spill and say, listen to each other. When you have a question, when somebody has a question, stop and listen. Don't leave anybody behind. Make sure you're always listening to each other and considering carefully their question. 
And of course, when people get started and they get wrapped up in the investigation and get get wrapped up in uh, their ideas of how to proceed, some people will get ignored because they'll say something and then the three other people, say you're in a team of four, one person says something and the three other people are like, no, 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 that's not important. Well, over and over again, at the end of the investigation, students say, oh, actually, you know, when we got stuck after barging forward for half a day, we, we realize we go back and realize the question that one of this other group member asked that we totally ignored was the key to solving a key puzzle piece in the investigation. And this moment is so typical of, of science. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I've become really interested in diversity and inclusion in science. If we have the most diverse set of people with the most diverse set of questions and opinions and ways of looking at a problem working together, that's the way we solve the most difficult questions. And so my work in West Africa, it, it's, it's not about inspiring people and giving people opportunities. It's selfish. I want smart, amazing, different people to join the community of astronomers so we can figure out what dark matter is, so that we can figure out what dark energy is, so we can figure out what these weird flashing lights in the universe are and, and therefore understand how, you know, how we came to be and how we fit into this beautiful, amazing universe. Yeah, and I love that. Right. I love that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, you know that it has to be both diversity and the inclusion with it. Mm -hmm. I heard a really good uh, yeah, metaphor. Yeah, like you can't be diverse and have people and then have them ignored. Yeah. you bring yeah. people in, but you have to make sure you listen to them and give them all the resources that are needed to actually do the work. Yep. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah, I, there's actually a quote mm -hmm. on the homepage for the website that had I just fell in love with. It's. Uh, from one of the students, I have learned that scientists are very curious. They are not so exceptional. They just ask lots of questions and they're really passionate about finding solutions to things. It's such yeah. an amazing life lesson and applicable in every aspect of your life. And this, it's so this summer school is just changing lives. Yeah. <laughs> um, one, uh, one of the things that yeah, that's definitely like one of the things I love most about science, asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, having the diverse background, you get different questions. You have people who exactly. everyone brings your own background and you've experienced things that I haven't experienced, that Jared hasn't experienced, that uh, Emmanuel hasn't experienced. Uh, it's a, we all have different perspectives and being able to see the world in just a little bit different way makes us phrase that question just a little bit differently. And it just triggers all sorts of yeah. different thought processes. And we just run exactly. from there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love it. Sorry, I'm just really excited by this. So I was wondering. No, no, I, I love that you're getting excited. Thank you. Well, yeah. I have to walk around so the lights don't turn off in here. Oh, oh that's all right. Oh, so. those are the light, the stars that keep turning on and off in your imagery. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see if you in there. So, right? Yeah, see if you variables in there. So. So I was wondering, <laughs> yeah. the, this program looks like it requires a lot of resource. And I know a resource, limited access to resource is one of the things that holds a lot of people back. How are you getting those resources? What kind of funding do you have? How do you get more funding? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, so, uh, Funding is one of the biggest difficulties that we have with with running YCA, and we've reached out to many different organizations um, for funding. One thing that we're going to launch at the end of April is a crowdfunding campaign to fundraise. So back to this idea of diversity um, in, in science and in astronomy and in, in any field, really, you know, I want more CEOs to be diverse more politicians to be diverse as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one way to allow most number of people to access the summer school is that we pay for our students travel to the school as well as their accommodation and food. And this, this um, increases our budget by 30%. So together with flying all the instructors in um, and then all the local costs as well, 
um, we, we, we haven't quite figured out how to fund everything for the 2019 school that will happen in October. So we're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign. Um, if you have like $5 or something, that would be incredible. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter at YCIA, or you can follow me um, also on Facebook, YCIA as well, or check out our website. Um, we're going to have that crowdfunding campaign there in, uh, in, as by the end of the month. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. I yeah. will definitely make sure that we send that out to everybody because yeah. uh, it's, it's just such an exciting program yeah. um, with that. So uh, just kind of like to sort of like a wrap up question that's coming from our chat room uh, that we have right here. Sifit is asking what area of science excites you for the future and what direction will you personally um, explore in the future? So what's the cool stuff coming mm -hmm. up and what do you want to get involved with as, as time goes on? Yeah, um, definitely one of the things I'm most excited about is this new thing that is this, it, it's always, it's been around for a while, but now it has a new name and it, it has really co coalesced the community together, multi-messenger astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at the things around us with our eyes, we see visible light. But if we then have a radio telescope or an X-ray telescope or other tools of seeing things, we start to build up a better information and more information about the physics of what's going on. And the newest thing that came around in 2016 is the discovery of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves is not even light. It's space-time <laughs> rippling. And by studying gravitational waves together with X-rays and gamma rays, um, visible light, infrared, radio, we can start to understand things that the most dramatic events in the universe, explosions uh, and pulsating stars. And that, that's what I want to study in the future. But another area that I'm super excited about is this interplay between medical imaging um, techniques and astronomy. I think it's fairly difficult because there are not many people that work across these two fields. But something I'm going to try and do is to keep in touch with both fields so that they can help each other. So back to this idea that diversity is, um, is the way to go. Not, diversity of cultural background, of your, your life experiences, but also the kind of research you do. So interdisciplinary science. I think the world's biggest problems, such as climate change or antibacterial resistance, um, food scarcity, all of these things are going to require disciplines to come together. Um, and so actually, I'm, I feel like I'm in a really exciting place right now um, with the Schmidt Science fellowship. It allows me to bridge disciplines. And with my next postdoc, I'm going to be working at Swinburne University in Australia, where they have access to 40 different telescopes to observe parts of the sky at the same time and finally figure out what these flashing lights are. We have no idea what they're going to be. No idea. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, good mysteries coming up, hopefully. Oh, my with that. goodness. <laughs> So, all right. So you work with all of these different organizations. And if you could give us just a rundown of what, where we can find the info on Dragonfly and YCIA and, any, and whatever else you're moving on to, how can we follow you and how can we get involved in your projects? Thank you. Um, definitely uh, follow YCIA. Um, drag, Dragonfly, we don't have social media presence yet, but we do have a website. Um, so if you search Dragonfly Telephoto Array, that should get you to the website. Or well, maybe I can send you some of these links afterwards. Yeah, we'll get them posted. Sure, yeah, we'll, yeah. Throw them, we'll throw them down there. So everybody okay. look, look down <laughs> there. Uh, <laughs> right there. Um, definitely also follow on Twitter, Schmidt, Schmidt Fellows. Um, so that's the program that's funding young researchers to do interdisciplinary science from an early stage. It's very difficult for someone who has experience in one field to get money to do something in another field because we're not proven. But Schmidt, oh, thank you for the, for the website. But the Schmidt Science Fellows, which is done in partnership with the Rhodes Trust, um, which funds the Rhodes Scholarship, they, they give us that opportunity. And I think more 
funding in, in these kind of, but it's a high risk funding avenue, but more funding in this area, I think can lead to a lot of cool stuff. So definitely follow Schmidt, um, Schmidt fellows. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the program that I'm joining in Swinburne University is called the Deeper. So deeper means you get to see fainter and fainter stuff. Wider, that means covering a larger part of the sky. Deeper, wider, faster, which means seeing things, taking shorter expo exposures, so, but still seeing faint stuff so that we can figure out what these flashing things in the sky are. Very, very um, there's cool. a website for a deeper, wider, faster program. Sounds like a Daft Punk song. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> a good one, Sarah, to wrap that up with. So, uh, Dr. Jai Lee Zhang, thank you so much thank for coming you. on the show today. Uh, best of luck to you at Oxford uh, and, and Dragonfly and all the cool stuff uh, that you're doing. So thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. And the questions are incredible. I feel like, can you come and work in astronomy, all, all of you? <laughs> well, there you go. Our chat right? room can come and collectively work uh, in the laboratory, I guess, at, well, the, at well, that. So. Tomorrow Research Institute. I yeah, like it sounds good to me. So t <laughs> yeah. tomorrow's research today or something. I don't know. And uh, also, not only do we have to thank uh, our, our guests who came on today, we also want to thank <laughs> you as well, our wonderful citizens of tomorrow. You help us make this show possible. Without your help, uh, there would be no studio, uh, there would be no equipment, there would be no way for us to talk uh, to our guests that come on, there would be no ability to deliver this to you. Uh, this is quite literally your show. Um, and we can't do it without you. And we just want to thank you so much for supporting us. And if you would like to know how to support us uh, financially, you can go to patreon.com slash TMRO. But even if you can't do so financially, we are more than welcome to help us out. Um, you could subscribe to us, hit the bell, like us, comment about things, uh, send out those videos, everywhere. Post them on your Facebook, your Twitter, whatever you got um, there. Uh, you can also go on our Discord uh, to talk with us if you mm -hmm. have skills uh, that you think might be helpful for us. And the community. Uh, yeah, also our community forum at community.tmro.tv. Um, you can even contact us through our website at yep. tmro.tv. So, uh, so even if you can't contribute financially, there's still a multitude of ways that you can help us out here at Tomorrow. And uh, just thank you so much for helping make these shows possible and delivering these amazing uh, amazing stories and amazing discoveries for the whole world to hear. So that's it for Orbit 12.14. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.